Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Keep alive the dream, O oh freedom, a tribute to the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington, D.C., World Arts Foundation, Inc. is proud to produce its 29th consecutive tribute to a great American hero and world citizen, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., at the Anthem Conference Center, located at Northeast 172nd and Sandy Boulevard in Portland, Oregon, Monday, January the 20th, 2014, from 11 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Welcome, folks. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host of the Oregon Voters Digest. And folks, we're really promoting this particular program because it's 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 timely. It's it's necessary that we do this uh, with me today uh, to talk a little bit more about this program. Are two of the founders, who are the major founders of this of, of this particular event and this foundation. I'm talking about uh, Michael Chappie Grice and Mr. Ken Berry. You might have known these folks within the community, but to those folks who are not as familiar uh, with these these individuals. Uh, these individuals are, are well known, uh, not only in the state of Oregon, but uh, around the country for that matter. Uh, and, and, and very entrenched, if you will. I'm just giving you a little bit more background on these folks because they tend not to want to talk about these issues. Uh, when, when I think about uh, Mr. Grice, uh, again, he's from a, from a, from a, from a world round sort of situation. He's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a consultant, he's, he's a number of, of he has a, all sorts of accolades along that particular line. And then on the other side with Ken, I could talk to more a bit about that piece, but, the, but in regards to Ken, uh, he was very much involved in the, in the so-called minority community, if not the black community, which a lot, of, a lot of us tend to have identified with, but it's been very progressive. It's gone to another level now. It's talking about the community across the board, across the board, across the state of Oregon, across this country. Uh, and he was at Jefferson High School. In fact, I remember when he was at the principal at the Jefferson High School. And... Um, and, and, and you know, and it was well respected along that particular line, line. And so he is very familiar with the community at large, and and that's very very important. And then when you, when you mix those two individuals up with reference to from a world known or nationwide or whatever, and then from a local perspective, from an Oregon perspective, you come up with with a program that tends to take Dr. King's uh, quote uh, era, if you will, when all of this happened back then, into a more progressive era. This is not just a, a black tribute, an African-American tribute to Dr. King. It's a, it's a, it's a country's uh, tribute to Dr. King. It's Oregon's tribute to Dr. King. And this is what we're going to be doing at this point in time in terms of how do we effectively get this information out. And one of those areas we want to, we want to make sure we stress on is that his legacy, and when you start thinking about the, the, doing the time, and, and, and Mr. Grace will talk about this a little bit more, what was happening during that era when he was when he made that speech and that march on Washington, whatever? There were many other things besides just the "I have a dream" speech. There was a lot of history. There, there was a lot of things about America, if you will, that was there. So the thing is that they have been putting this piece and trying to get this information out to the public at large. But now, all of a sudden, I think we need this. This we need more of this information in our educational system. We need it in the schools. We need to educate folks. And too often, a lot of times, we want to educate the parents, but a lot of times, it's a little too late. We need to start, at some point, start at the grassroots, right at the, at, the, at the beginning, if you will, and give young people the opportunity to be able to be a part of what's, what's going on with that history. Because as you know, and I, I've been reminded to be behind these two individuals at, at, at many times, was that if you don't know your culture, you don't know nothing. <laughs> you've got to know your culture, where you've been, in order to be, know where you're going. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. I think I've said enough now. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Fine, fine. It's an honor to be here. Good. Appreciate that. Well, why don't you just give them again just a little, a little, uh, little quickie extra to be in in terms of how you put the program together. You guys can do enemy back and forth. And then, and then let's get right into this idea of educating. And, and now that you've gotten it in the Gresham area where, you, where you're located, whatever. Talk to me. Well, we've progressed. And I think that was one of the uh, hallmarks of Martin Luther King was to always move forward, not just to march, but to march forward. And we've, uh, we've been uh, blessed to have uh, a number of people help us 
all along the way. Mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference when we are talking about collaboration with the schools, mm -hmm. when collaboration with the community, with our sponsors, with our parents and families. Okay, okay. Ken, and speaking of education, one of the things we, we're very fortunate, and you've heard me say this before, and um, with, the, with the work and support of so many people, because our goal is not to, and we appreciate all the accolades that you've given us, but we, we use the term many times, we're not only standing on the shoulders of those who have passed on before us, mm -hmm. we're standing on the shoulders of those who are among us. You're one of those heroes. Mm -hmm. We're standing on your shoulders. We're standing on our parents and those who trained us mm -hmm. over the years. Many times I say to people that, you know, the program is, is not a, a Ken Berry or Michael Grice or World Arts program. Mm -hmm. It's a community program that embraces every culture, embraces the young and the Oh, and I'm speaking of education. Mm -hmm. This year, what we're trying to do, what mm -hmm. we're trying to do is to do more than just a program right. featuring the arts. Right. We are going to be educating because in celebration of the 50 year anniversary, mm -hmm. we are going to use vignettes, videotape or DVD vignettes, thanks to Alan Wan, uh, thanks to the vision of Teresa Rayford, thanks right. to the help and support of Janice Hopkins, just to name a few of the people that are working with us. Our goal is to pass this torch on mm -hmm. to some younger folks because, like you said earlier, we want to make sure our young people are informed about our history, and particularly his history, not only locally, but across the country as well. Mm -hmm. We have such people as greats, I, I consider a greats, like the Senator Avel Gorley. It's going to be doing a special piece on women and civil rights. And mm -hmm. so we, we have different educational components built into the program this year that is going to be more than just entertainment. It's going to be education. Another thing we're focusing on is bringing the entire family. Mm -hmm. This is an, a family affair. And, and we, we want to commend the Portland area because there are other projects going on. Maranatha is doing a project from 1 to 3 o'clock on that same day on the 20th on Monday. There's another, the, the prayer breakfast is going on with, with uh, the scanner. Yeah. And, and there's right, several other right, things. Right. We just want to commend and applaud all of those individuals and, and those corporations that are doing things in honor of Dr. King because, again, the model is it's not a day on. It's a day. It's not, not a, day. a day off. There we go. It's a day on. There we go. We're yeah. on every year. Yeah. <laughs> We're on every year. Ken yeah. always reminds us, too, that uh, we stand not only on the shoulders of those who have come before right. us. Right, right. We stand on the shoulders of those who are among us. Right, and there right, are many right. people, community service right. like right. yourself, right. Avel right. Gordley, right. Lou Frederick. There's right. a number, Margaret right. Carter. Right. Right. Not only the people right. who have been representing us in the public life at the legislature, but those who have been representing us in our local mm -hmm. churches, those who have mm -hmm. been representing us in our local youth programs and mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. our schools in particular. Well, you know, again, and that's why I'm not trying to be redundant again. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's been this sort of air about the commercialization of the Dr. King, this, right. this particular right. deal. You know what I'm saying? You know, people come, you know, hey, just, uh, I was there. <laughs> you know, I got my receipt sure. for that day. Got my point? Or if not that, uh, in the schools, if you will, they might have had a program, just an announcement or whatever. But that, but, but his era, that, that era was, was va valuable. There was, a, there was a lot of history there yes. of this country. And I think it, it, when you think about today's situation that we're having now among the races, if you will, we, we just still haven't gotten it. Right. Am, well, am I this, getting... is, this is why one of the things we're fortunate, first of all, between Michael and myself probably, to have a, a century's worth of educational background right. and, and the people that touched our lives, those that, that raised us and put their arms around us and embraced us you know, through this whole journey taught us that it's important that we give service back. And so we try to cross all the boundaries, you know. We bring the young, the old, the, we bring the Democrats, the Republicans, we bring the, the, the season, the, the non-season, we bring everyone together under one roof mm -hmm. to try to make sure that we're all working for the same cause, and that is justice for all. Mm -hmm. Now what about the schools? Are, 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 do you have any, are you doing any educational kind of thing within the schools now well, today? Well, uh, indirectly and directly. Uh, some of our direct services have to do with helping youngsters learn music. Uh, and there are a couple of programs that are outside of the school, but they actually do their rehearsal in the school. Uh, Ken he won't celebrate much of his work, but you know, one of the things that Ken does is, is his real um, strength is being a, an itinerant musician. Mm -hmm. Go from one school to the mm -hmm. next school mm -hmm. to the next school, and I've seen him take a hundred children, sometimes more, teach them a song. And the songs that he selects are going to then be historical songs. They're mm -hmm. going to tie these students to great American classical music, whether it be jazz or whether it be gospel. These, this tradition originated in America. And I'm glad that you mentioned about uh, history in schools because um, you know, they say people that don't learn their history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to repeat many of the mistakes that have come before us. But um, uh, a little known fact, as we 
use this program to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington is to call the people's attention that the reason that they had a March on Washington wasn't just for jobs and freedom in 1963, led by A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King, John Lewis was going to be in Portland on the 19th, mm -hmm. but it was also because it was the commemoration itself of the Emancipation Proclamation right. from 100 years, years before ago. that. Right, right. So if we only go back 50 years, we're doing ourselves a disservice. If we only go back to slavery, we're doing ourselves a disservice. If we don't recognize the great ancient kingdoms of Ghana and Mali and Songhai and help kids connect in that way, that they have roots that, of which they can be very proud. Or as August Wilson put it, our kids won't always aspire to a pair of tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, now, again, on, on that same particular line, now, when you, you mentioned about Ken basically uh, talking to his music and this, that, and that, now, is this just the Portland metropolitan area, the Portland public schools, or this, or is it, or this statewide? I mean, what are you doing to get out of Well, two things. First of all, we're focusing. I retired from Portland public I know, schools that's 10 right. years ago. That's right. Okay. But my wife won't let me stay home. So I work part time. <laughs> so thank goodness I'm in a situation. I'm at Fabian School, for example. This, those students are going to be opening up the program this year, where we're going to be bringing in Dr. Joy DeGru, a piece that we did back in 1999 at Jefferson High School, where she talks about children are the seed of the future, which is going to lead to one of the songs that our kids from Fabian School will be doing, called "Harvest for the World." Mm -hmm. So we have about 10 to 12 schools that are going to be participating, but, but only in this particular, in this particular, area, this particular, area, this particular area, not area. outside of this area. Well, that's uh, what, what, there is what a new area uh, of we collaborate with organizations such as the NAACP, the Urban League, the Coalition of Black Men, the Portland African American Leadership Forum, directly and indirectly. And mentoring is one of the strategies that we have, whether it's in the arts or whether it's in education. And we like to to characterize ourselves as working hard at the intersection of education and the arts. Mm -hmm. And so now in the Gresham Barlow School District, in their middle schools, we have launched a mentoring program for young males to help incorporate the young African-American males who are having some problems in the schools mm -hmm. and or with the schools integrating them into and the population has migrated east. So there's a great need out there. They are welcoming that response and as we get our um, foot in the door, so to speak, or as we help them discover the talents that we bring to help all of the children, then it's really it's really helpful and it's it's migrating east. Uh, the rest of the state they draw from us because there are programs in Corvallis and in Eugene that mimic what we do here they in do. Portland. They don't have as many of the resources or the expertise of a Ken Berry to help them uh, envision that, but many of them try Vancouver, Washington, which is out of the, uh, the city ground, boundaries, battleground, battle right. uh, and we connect with all of those folk uh, to assist. I know Dina Perot is having a program uh, on the holiday itself, and so there are a number of, of, of people who are, are helping us uh, reach out and using some of what we've learned to enhance what they're doing in their communities, large and small. We should also mention the fact that we've been very fortunate because we've been doing this, uh, we're saying the 29th, but we actually started this May 2nd, 1978, with Herb Cawthorn. And we have been able to basically collect so many videotapes that we're now working towards transferring those over to prepare to make lesson plans and make available to different districts or different uh, civic social organizations as well. Are you finding that the kids, uh, the ones that you have been in engaging with, are you finding them getting the enthusiasm, if you will, to counter this? This issue about the failure rate that exists here at the Portland Metropolitan. Well, I try to help, help the community think about it in this way. If you only describe your community in terms of the problems that you have, right, okay. you have a problem community. Okay, right. And at the national level, with the National Council on Educating Black Children, one workshop or presentation that we make um, has to do with we tried everything mm -hmm. and it worked. In other words, uh, it doesn't matter whether you introduce the students to high-level mathematics in the summertime. The American Music Program, as Sarah Memory directs, now located at Martin Luther King Jr. Academic K-8 here in Portland, where the students are being introduced to American classical music and they go to New York and compete with the, with the Duke Ellington competition there, or whether you're uh, using uh, music in the schools. Uh, I teach aviation. Uh, to uh, fifth grade and sixth grade population through Portland Community College and the Airway Science for Kids and uh, Urban Wings. And uh, what I'm finding personally for my own uh, direct services to youngsters is that it really doesn't matter what you teach them. What matters is how you teach them. Mm -hmm. What matters is how much they feel like they are valued and then they will give their best effort mm -hmm. because it's about elevating the expectations and what I have found and what we have found in, in the field among the best educators in America is that kids respond. 
uh, depending on the expectations that you have. And teaching fifth and sixth graders to fly planes is, the, is proof of seeing mm -hmm. seventh and eighth graders learn complex uh, mm -hmm. music uh, uh, arrangements is really uh, fulfilling and very uh, encouraging. And Asa Hilliard, one of our mentors, uh, said that one problem that we do not have is the intellectual capacity of our children. Hmm. <laughs> How about the other one? We can whenever we choose? We can whenever and wherever we choose, <laughs> successfully teach all children whose education is of interest to us. Mm -hmm. We already know more than we need in order to do it. Mm -hmm. Whether we do it or not must mm -hmm. finally depend on how we feel, mm -hmm. on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. That's Dr. Ron Edmonds. Oh, good, I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing that you, you brought up is that, now you're teaching aviation, right? Yes, sir. At PCC, right? Yes, sir. And you're, you're doing the music piece, what, father? Well, we, the class is called Integration Arts. Integration with Art. With emphasis on music. But the idea is that when, when does it take off and these other folks pick it up and, and expand some of the things that you guys are trying to do? I'm gonna, I, I realize how enthusiastic you all are. What are we doing to basically put it in the hands of other individuals? Well, I think it's characterized in uh, one of Martin Luther King's uh, books. You know, he wrote four. Many people aren't familiar with the titles or not, are aware that Martha, not Martha King was more than an I Have a Dream speech, but also a scholar and an art author, and he emphasized education. And so uh, the, the, the title of one of his books is Why We Can't Wait. Mm -hmm. So whether everybody gets on the bandwagon or not, World Arts Foundation Incorporated, working hard at the intersection of education and the arts, advances programs, makes proposals, engages young people and their family, whether everybody is on board or not, and we just trust that our expertise and our integrity uh, and the elders that have shown us the way that we can do what we can with what we have, whether everybody uh, has caught on or not, and we see over time that they do catch on and they do uh, come along with us. Okay, we're, we're making the point, again, the show is also making the point that Oregonians, all Oregonians should be given the opportunity to participate. Yes and possibly attend. And so what would be some of that benefits, if you will, by attending uh, this event uh, in, in Gresham? Oh my goodness. Talk to me. There's so many different things. I mean, first of all, you'll see a demonstration of young people and you'll see families that come together. You'll see- Of a, diverse group, of across diverse the board. Group, a, a diverse group, a, a, of course. And the other thing is the fact that with our Dream Village, uh, we're allowing uh, close to 30 to 35 individual vendors come and basically showcase their wares. And plus, we're very fortunate because it's going to be tape delayed right here on PCM. Okay. Uh, it's going to start at 3 o'clock. It's also going to be a tape delayed on Channel 28. It will be webcast live from the church, from the Anthem Church, and also on KBOO Radio 90.7 FM. Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate, the fact that, you know, right here at PCM and, and also television services through Portland Public Schools uses the program that's aired throughout the year. So it's not just a one-day program. We showcase students throughout the year. So I think one of the benefits, main benefits, is coming together because we have close to 80 components that is part of this program. That's from speakers to individual groups that are performing and, and we do DVD inserts. And with that comes a great deal of information, of education and motivation and encouragement for why it's important that we continue Dr. King's dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many people, they come away from it uh, feeling a new sense of both courage and encouragement, of uh, motivation and commitment mm -hmm. as a result of attending and seeing the, as Ken pointed out, the diverse range of, of people and ideas that are presented. That's why it takes seven and a half hours to get it across uh, right. because it's nonstop and 80 <laughs> yeah, axes right, are, right, is a lot right. of acts. Nobody but Ken Berry would take this on. <laughs> because they tried to tell me to shorten it. And I, I've gotten into arguments with folks. And say, well, but we want to expand and use this day as an opportunity to really get as much in as we possibly can. And then, again, like you said, just really getting the word out yes. and getting folks yes. to participate and interact. This is not just a black program, if no, you will, not at all. aspect of it. I'm thinking about the notables. Right. You know, right. In fact, uh, we right. just in this state, we've just recently uh, have identified the governor as the uh, as the state superintendent, if you will, yes, of all school. Now, I take it he is going to be an attendee, right? I think it would be a good thing to have done. It, it, what about a notable like that? Well, he's made a commitment in the form of writing. It's in the printed program. It's always questioned whether he's able to get around to the various programs, but he's been on our program before and giving yes. a live presentation. Okay. I want to point to something about that's very exciting. But before you get off of that particular point, I, I can appreciate what you're saying, but in all due respect, maybe it was just a chair or his deputy, if you will, at that board, should someone should be there representing that board 
to try to move this other piece in regards to getting well, it. Well, that's always open. Do you recognize with you? Is that, is that still open? open? It's always open. Okay. Because I, the fact I, just, that, I wanted to make yes. sure I mentioned yes. that part. Yes. Yes. Hopefully, they'll yeah. be encouraging it. Exactly. You'd be well, surprised the yes. number of celebrities that show up. Yes. That Donnie Adair, who's our chief MC, right. he identifies them when they come in the room. We have our ushers and our hostess uh, make sure that they either get acknowledged or get a moment on stage, or sometimes they get recorded, and then it gets inserted into our rebroadcast. Okay, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Going on. No, I was just saying that something that uh, last week, uh, kind of in a different uh, lane, as we say, um, uh, Javier Nero was here, the young oh, trombone artist. Right, right. And he uh, is now graduated from the Juilliard School and is at the University of Miami doing his graduate work. We did an interview on KBU Radio, our partner in broadcasting, and it was picked up by friends of mine in Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. because not only are we simulcasting it on the radio, but it also is being streamed across the globe. Anybody that, t that taps into kboo.fm mm -hmm. uh, on that day will be able to hear the entire program. So that's very, very exciting and we've just now ha launched a campaign uh, to notify as many people around the country as a market that we really haven't tapped into before mm -hmm. other than just incidentally and happenstance to deliberately get them to tune in and we think that will bring a little uh, more notoriety and probably an opportunity for people to donate and and help us. Let's, yeah. let's, let's not forget PCM yeah. here, Portland Community. Portland, yeah, Portland, you know, we're YouTube. Yes, yes, you know, we're yeah. right on. Yeah. We're right there now. That's we're right. with the front right. of the line. You know Been with us from the okay. very. Let's, let's, I mean, we can go all the way back to the very beginning. All right. You all know, right. with with PCM. Yeah, you give know, us credit. People like uh, Larry Dunham and oh, yes. and oh, yes. uh, Lenny Edwards yes. and Von Bailey and Brother Little. Just just to name yeah. a few. Yeah. Voters Digest. Yeah, Voters Digest. Right here. Just to mention a few. First of all, we want to thank you. This is our third time this season, so this is a record for us. And we thank you. Day one when I was in Marine Corps uniform there. You can. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's it. We couldn't do it without it. Without no, you, we no couldn't problem. do it without no, our elders. No. But it, it's, it's so important, yeah. you know. And, and, and that's been, been one of the things that PCM, as you know, mm -hmm. community television is yes. all about. Yes. Grassroots. That's yep. right. You know, we Keep need to them. educate our grassroots. Yep. Okay. Very, very important piece. Okay. Uh, what other interesting pieces that you think we well, might? I, I like to go. You know, to, I like to think about history sometimes, particularly people and individuals that we've had along the way that, that we're very, very, very proud of, like the, the John L. Bells, the Lovey Jacksons, and people, the Reverend Wars, just to name a few of the folks. And, and, and I'd like to mention also the fact that we're bringing some people back this year that was part of our original, like Ada and Ray Tellis, mm. who now live in the East Coast. They, they're, they're professional all the way uh, in regards to music, uh, recording, and consultants. They're coming back to, to sing in the program, participate in the program. Tracy Harris is going to be with us, one of our original Youth Sound members is going to be with us. We're going to be honoring John Gaynor and Inspirational Sounds from Eugene, Oregon, one mm -hmm. of the groups that have been coming down to Portland for the last 15 to 20 years to help with different nonprofit organizations for fundraising and things of that nature. So we, we have a whole host of, uh, of, of, of components to the program that, that there won't be a dull moment during the day. Blue from Mitchell? Blue Mitchell from Los Angeles, California, mm. a writer, composer, actor, who also is a consultant and producer of various people out of Hollywood is coming to do a special piece for us as well. So, we're well, very fortunate. And I like you mentioning these names because these are role models, you know what yeah. I mean, that are so unnecessary for our youth today, if you will. And I notice how you've been, how you just basically made them uh, sort of uh, universal, if you will, and from the standpoint of inclusionary yes. uh, within, within uh, as Americans right. they, they, who happen to be African Americans. Right. And I want the folks to know this, you know, because too often what we tend to have to be right off the bat, we don't have the role models. Right. Well, well many role models yeah. will be. We're also very fortunate. Senator Wyden's yeah. office called. Uh, okay. Senator Merkley's office is involved. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner uh, Loretta Smith who's going to be there. Commissioner Nick Fish, the mayor, is going to be there for sure. So we, we, we try to reach out and allow anyone that wants to come on board to be part of the program. Okay. We try to keep it, you know, time biased yeah. because yeah. we don't want to go over yeah. time. But yeah. we're very fortunate to have and that. under uh, the uh, undercurrent. Uh, and common theme that we have throughout all this is to continue to strive toward freedom. We may not be there, but we know that it's a, an honorable goal. And uh, although it's an unfortunate uh, note in history, we recently lost uh, a world-class leader in the form of South African President Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I hope people see his film. I don't have any stake in the outcome of that film, but I do know that um, people will come away from that being reminded of just what it takes to be a leader mm -hmm. and what leadership really uh, involves in terms of the level of commitment. And so when you meet people who are leaders, even on our local level, you realize a little more about what they have to contribute and what they have to sacrifice for the common good. 
And so in that sense, we're fortunate not only that it's, uh, we're in sync with the commemoration, of the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, but also with the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And all those things converge with um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we use that whole title, by the way, deliberately. Reverend Dr. Martin, Martin Luther King, King Jr. to know that he was a man of the cloth and, uh, you know, a Ph.D. scholar. And I might mention, too, that since we're talking about um, the ways in which the diversity is a force mm -hmm. that we favor um, and the struggle to get the Voting Rights Act, the struggle to get the Civil Rights Act, these were all part of the product of one of our friends, Congressman Augustus F. Hawkins. The late Gus Hawkins was author of the Voting Rights Act, was author of the, of the Civil Rights Act, was author of the Humphrey Hawkins Fair Employment Act. And he pointed out to, to the educators in particular that, that black children are just the proxy for what's wrong with American education in general. And so as we fashion solutions to help black children, we fashion solutions to help all children. Good point. That's a good, that's a good, good point. Now, so where do we go from here? What do you tell the people after after you have this event on the twentieth? Where, where do we go from here? Give, give them some any, any insight, any any. Well, as Martin go? Luther King said, "Go back to Mississippi, <laughs> go back to Alabama, go back to North Portland, That's right. go That's back right. to Grant High School. Each one, take one. Do what Reach you up. can. Yes, right. Be active and work with other people. It's not about you. Right. right. It's about how you can serve." Because that service is the rent we pay for our space on earth. And if we and can encourage we people to come a little closer, to communicate a little more confidently, and to do their part, we have a stronger community, and all people will benefit from that, especially the children. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to throw, I'm a, you, know, you know me, I'm always throwing some goodies out on the table aspect mm -hmm. of it. You know, we, we've, been, we've been pretty well identified with the whole issue of gang members here. Uh, with, 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 in most cases, the African American community aspect of it. Do you have anything as part of the program that kind of yes, we reaches out to some of those young yeah. people and yes. talk about that situation and possibly going going to the table with quote, let's see if we can do a, a, a espungement, if you will, of something because as you know, once they're labeled along that particular line, they have no life in the future. Mm -hmm. The only thing they're looking at is the criminal justice system. Do you have anything in the program? Well, it turns that out that the uh, World Arts Foundation is a partner with Race Talks okay. to uh, facilitate greater communication among the races. And this week's program, turns out, produced by Donna Maxey, um, is called, uh, you know, Addressing the School to Prison Pipeline. So helping youngsters have greater integrity, helping, helping youngsters to focus on virtue, uh, will help them. And we never know uh, how many lives we've already saved or how many people have already avoided mm -hmm. the criminal justice system. We don't, we're not able to keep stats on that, mm -hmm. but we believe that it's a great number. When I look around and, and see the leadership at Roosevelt High School, when I see the leadership at SEI, when I see the football program, the junior league football programs that engage so many uh, youngsters, we never know how many of those youngsters would otherwise be available for gangs. Well, my mama used to say that I don't mind is the devil's mm -hmm. workshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you can keep youngsters busy, and particularly if you can keep them engaged, and particularly if you can keep them engaged in education and the arts, then we know that we're doing something along that line. If we can inspire some other people to amplify their program, put more resources into um, prevention, as opposed to simply incarceration, and our society is learning this now, that it's a way, a much more expensive model simply to lock people up than it is to prevent them from going and becoming better citizens in the first place. Well, hey guys, this has been great. And one Thank last comment, Bruce. they should attend. You want Anybody want to make an announcement in terms of where and what time? What day does it, Ken? What day is that day? It's going to be a Monday, January 20th. It's going to be from 11 o'clock until 6.30, live, and it's going to be at the Anthem Church, 3300, Northeast 172nd Place, right off of Northeast Sandy Boulevard. And 172nd, and there's nothing like uh, being there in person. You know, yeah. you can pick it up on the radio, you can watch it on the tape delay, Extreme. but everyone who has experienced it coming through the door and being part of that community that intentionally comes out to 172nd. As we've moved it east, we've been at Jefferson High School, we've been at the University of Portland, we've been at the local churches, and now to be in a, in a first-class facility with all the technical needs that make it uh, possible for us to produce a first-rate show, uh, people who come are going to come away with something very beautiful and very fulfilling. Okay. Well, I tell you what, folks, we're, we're going we're gonna to take a short break, and what we're going to do when we come back, we're going to have uh, one of the individuals that should have shown up, uh, one of the two interviews that should have shown up, and I'm talking about the, the state chair of the Republican Party and Art Robinson, and, and hopefully we're going to probably get something in the Democratic chair one way or the other in the future. But the bottom line, we are sitting in a political kind of an environment right now. They are communicating to a number of people with issues and whatever, and I think it's very, very important that all the candidates that are running out there understand what the issues are. 
and this is one of the issues that they should be supporting. And uh, so we've got the we got Mr. Roberts who's going to be here in, in this next half hour, and we're going to talk about his support and some of the other ideas. Thank you for promoting it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for being us. and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Good Roberts. Show. Okay, hurry right, back. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back, folks. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. segment of the Voters Digest. This is the, the second half hour of the show and and we're really excited about uh, here at PCM and the Oregon Voters Digest uh, promoting World Arts Foundation Inc. and hopefully that you will participate on the, the 20th birthday of Dr. King because it represents more than just Dr. King. It represents America and it's very important to, to be a part of that history but besides the history the, the, the educational viewpoint that that history brings to the table especially today. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons why I've asked the, uh, uh, both the uh, Republican Party and the Democratic Party to participate in understanding uh, how important uh, that period was and hopefully be shared with, with, with the leaders, with, with basically future leaders. So that's what these folks are doing. They are, they are future leaders. They're going to they're be elected to office and, and representing folks. And so anyway, and this is why we, we wanted to do this. And so we just so happened to have had the, uh, we got the invitation and, and we, we, we've, uh, we've invited both uh, the chair of the House and the chair of the Democratic Party. However, the, the chair of the Democratic Party could not make it. And uh, uh, so what we've got is that we got the chair of the Republican Party. We're fortunate okay. to do that. Welcome aboard. Thank you. How you doing, Art? Thanks, Brian. Sounds great. Well, look, uh, you, you've, um, you've had the opportunity to kind of get a, I know you've gotten a feel for, for what this program's all about. but. But just, just some of your remarks. How do you feel about the, the, the whole issue? What, what did Dr. King do uh, in regards to your mind? Well, uh, of course, what he did in his time, right. uh, working against injustice against his race, was, of course, magnificent. Uh, I was just rereading his speech from 1963 before the program, and, of course, he cited the founding fathers, cited the principles of the country, and, of course, was concerned about the fact that uh, those principles weren't being applied equally to Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thought that crossed my mind, though, that is that uh, his remarks are more relevant today than they were when he, when he said them. Mm. When he made them, he was concerned about his, the black people, the African-American people. And, of course, he was right. But today, we find that all of our people 
are having the same problem. The uh, justice, the uh, self-government, the freedom built into our founding documents, which at that time was not being uh, honored with respect to the black people, is more and more not being honored with respect to all Americans. Mm -hmm. And so we see this vast freedom movement, liberty movement, growing across America. And it's, it sounds almost like you, you could play a speech for those people, they'd understand it just as well. Mm -hmm. He thought, I believe he thought, that his work and the work of people like him would bring justice and freedom and liberty to the black people. And he did, of course, a lot along those lines. But today, there's a great regression. And in fact, his words are, can be spoken today on behalf of all Americans, because whether they're Hispanic or African American or white or Asian, all of us are losing the same freedoms to a huge, overreaching government, political uh, bureaucracy mm -hmm. that is impressing us all. Mm -hmm. So freedom has, uh, he would have thought that freedom would remain and his people would share in it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, that partly happened because of his work, but now there's a regression and we all need the same words because their the lack of freedom is affecting us all. Good, good. I tell you what we're going to do. I've got. I just happen to have uh, Teresa Rayford, who works very closely with the World Arts Foundation Inc. And uh, I was wanting to get get her comments in regards to the whole issue of uh, what the uh, as far as the educational piece mm -hmm. in the World Arts Foundation uh, within the local area aspect of it. So we're going to sort of put her on the put her on the line right now, get her remarks, and then I want to come right back to uh, uh, Mr. Richardson. And we'll go beyond that point. We're going to take advantage, if you will, of the fact that he is the state chair of the Republican Party, and we're going to spend some time with him on that issue, too, okay? Let's see, we got, is Ms. Rayford on the air? Ms. Rayford, are you on the air? Teresa? Yes, sir, I'm here. How you doing, yes, Teresa? Yes, I'm here. Hey, look, uh, we've hey, been... Hey, I'm doing all right, Bruce. Good, good, good. Thanks for, thanks for being available to you, because I know you're a very busy person, if you will. And, and uh, so, look, uh, we had been talking about the idea of uh, World, World Arts Foundation doing things uh, locally within the school system. Uh, you and I, you had mentioned to me about uh, some of the other activities that you were involved with and from a local standpoint. Would you mind sharing that with us? Oh, absolutely. And, and just let me start from the beginning, because in Oregon, um, one of the things that you had mentioned is that we're not teaching our black history in the schools. And uh, what you thought that would come out of some of these programs would be an educational format that would be, you know, basically a curriculum that would be taught to the children. So in that conversation, you know, we mentioned some of the things that are happening with the Smithsonian, with the old freedom programs that they have regarding the education of civil rights. And so uh, that was kind of the inspiration for this year's theme. And so with what with World Arts Foundation, Inc. is going to be doing is they're going to be blueprinting an opportunity to change their program format into an educational curriculum with the partnership of different doctors from different universities that are already sending in syllabuses and everything else to accommodate their structure and to basically use it to interest children in the different industries that are related to the program that they have. So you'll see children that are gaining interest in publishing, distribution, and engineering, and all of these are art-related industries, but we never look at them as relative. Mm -hmm. So with everyone talking about bringing STEAM and STEM programming into the educational system, these guys are, are way on the fast track with already developing the outreach and also building the curriculum. So I'm just proud to be a part of the team. Well, thank you very, very much. This is really great. To, in fact, it's good to know that you're going to be you're still part of that team, if you will. And uh, I want to make sure I got your comments. Uh, and by the way, on, just on a side note, uh, uh, you know, I, I know this, these are political times for that matter. And uh, uh, tell me, uh, are you looking at the, you ran for city council that last time around and, and you, you had a wealth of information and, and belt background with reference to working with the grassroots here in the metropolitan area. Are you planning on doing anything along that line? Well, I mean, it's, it's open season, and there's a couple of seats that are opening up, so it's always what the people want. And I've been approached by several people in our community, so I'm really looking into it. Okay. I think you'll be a great person. In fact, we're looking for good, solid leadership, and it's all about the grassroots because there's really a need, a need, a very a much needed effort in regards to developing leadership. And especially the fact you're a young person, and it's always important to get young people involved in the process. 
So, hey, good luck oh, to you. And, and anything I can do to help you out along that particular line, uh, please give me a call, okay? Right on. Thank you, Bruce. Sure enough. Take care. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. Now, let's get back here down to this end. Since I've opened up that other little side part, I, I figured that since we didn't have the Democratic chair here sitting there, hopefully, hopefully we're going to get you guys together. Can yeah, we do that? I, I'd be nice. Can if we people do that? Really participate. And I, I think I that'd think, be very, very informative. Okay, and then we're going to get Bob. Bob is, Bob is normally here, but he had some other things going too at the same time. So, so we're going to uh, get Bob. Uh, he's my cohort. And uh, we're going to try to see if we can get both of you guys and see if we can kind of, because that's what it's all about. It's, it's all about doing what's right. And I, and then so I just happen to know you a little bit better, so therefore I'm here interviewing you today. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you, Art. I I know um, uh, some of the things that uh, uh, that I know about you in terms of some of your background. I naturally I had the opportunity to read that Oregonian article. That's not, that's how we communicated mm -hmm. with one another. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, we talked about um, the whole issue of sickle cell. You you made. I'm just going to just throw some things oh, yeah. out. Yeah, you know, share with you mind what, 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 the sickle cell piece because it, it is an issue. Well, I'm a, I'm a biochemist, a okay. scientist, so I have a scientific perspective on it. But it was the first uh, a disease, molecular disease uh, understood, a very big landmark in biochemistry. Uh, it turns out that uh, a single mutation on one of the amino acids on the hemoglobin that carries oxygen in the blood causes the uh, hemoglobin to sort of crystallize and distort the shape of the blood cell. That's why it's called sickle cell anemia. And when that happens, those cells can't get to the small capillaries properly, and there's oxygen deprivation. And this, of course, harms the individual, has great pain, and uh, usually leads to a short life. Uh, it was interesting, why would it be so prevalent, especially mm -hmm. in African Americans? The reason is malaria. Uh, if you carried one of the genes for sickle cell anemia, uh, you, you, you were afflicted with a disease if you had them both. But if you carried one, it helped to protect you from malaria. And malaria was so common in Africa that even though a fourth of the population, those that carried both sickle cell genes, mm -hmm. were suffering early deaths and, uh, and a lot of uh, pain, uh, it was laid, stayed in the population because the others were immune from malaria because it was there. Very strange circumstance. But it was a great milestone in science because it was the first molecular disease. It was the first time that a, the, a change in a protein molecule was fully understood in terms of the damage it does to human health. Okay. Another, in fact, I, again, I, I'm very interested. And in fact, I'm, I'm sure the community was, I, I was interested because of the background in terms mm -hmm. of what you're doing now. Yeah. Okay. The other point I would like to throw out is that what are, what are you doing now? Is my understanding you're doing some research? Well, I, I'm I specialize. I'm a scientist. Right, I, I'm right. Educated at Caltech. Right. I used to be on the faculty of UC San Diego. I spent my life in research, and the two fields that my colleague and I work on the most is one: uh, little clocks that are built into protein molecules, little mm -hmm. molecular clocks. When a protein is, you know, your whole body is protein. Okay. Uh, we think we have to eat protein, mm -hmm. but in fact, all of the functions of our body, structural and otherwise, are protein mediated. Mm -hmm. These are huge molecules. Turns out those molecules change with time. They have little clocks built in them, chemical clocks. And we're specialists, uh, probably the world's uh, most foremost, foremost specialists in the rate at which those clocks run okay. and how they work. Mm -hmm. So we study that. The other thing we study, entirely different, we study the amount of information that can be gotten from a urine or blood or breast sample that can help people have better health, the quantitative measurement of health. This involves diagnosis of disease or following disease progress during therapy or trying to catch diseases before they occur for preventive medicine. And this has advanced a long way. We now measure about 5,000 chemical constituents in a tiny drop of urine. Wow. And then we do experiments to correlate those with things that will be helpful in people in maintaining good health. And you're, you're sort of open to anyone that'd be interested in possibly being yeah, we were actually using the public as, as, right? as okay. subjects okay. because okay. We, uh, uh, we're now calibrated. The procedures have become, uh, we, we began this field in the 70s, but, and then the technology was very uh, difficult to use. Today, technological advances made this field very relevant, mm -hmm. and we're calibrating the techniques now. We're doing it by collecting urine samples from the public and, and, and 
and use them to calibrate the technique. You get a lot of samples from people with one illness, and then you compare them with the control, and mm -hmm. you learn the profile of the 5,000 substances that correlates with that mm -hmm. disease. So, so as a layman's standpoint, if I were to say to you that, okay, what, I, what I'm hearing you saying to me is that if you're taking a urine sample from me, uh, you could go in there and pretty well check out uh, the, uh, maybe the elements of a particular disease. The pattern. The pattern you, of a You measure 5,000 things and look at the pattern characteristic the pattern. of a particular okay. illness. And urine isn't the only, actually I think breath ultimately would be the best. Okay. You can do the same thing with breath. And these methods have not been calibrated yet, that is correlated in such a way that you find them in the doctor's office. Now what are you talking about, breath milk or, or just the breath? No, breath. 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 Okay, you got, breath. you got me all I'm, Breath. I got me. <laughs> uh, your breath contains thousands of substances, really? too, that are wow. characteristic of your health. I don't think it'll be too long, maybe another decade, before these techniques are calibrated to the point that uh, we can see diseases before they, you know you're sick, mm -hmm. and we can follow uh, therapy in such a way that it can be modified to give you a better chance of recovery. We diagnose disease. The technology of measuring breath and urine. Okay. Uh, and other body fluids, but those are the easiest to get, uh, has advanced tremendously, and it, it's really going to change lives and extend lifespan as it develops further. And you're open to donors across the board? Oh, yeah. Well, we, we send flyers around to ask people to participate. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah. But, if, but otherwise, they could I contact you. I don't use your program trying to get urine from your That's from okay. Your I, I think that's yours. what I'm going to do. I mean, they ask me. Every time I go to the VA, they always ask me so, for a sample anyway. Well, it's, kinda, it's, it's, it's pretty funny because we have a man that's involved in politics. Yes. Who's asking the voters for urine samples? Is that what it's, yeah. oh, we don't want to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I do for a living. So. Tom, that one, he, he's, v, he's VA too. He has, he, they get an extraction from him too every week, just like me. Uh, <laughs> okay. breath, breath is probably the thing that will be used in the future yeah. the most, because, okay. but it, the technology for measuring and storing it is more difficult, okay. so the advances are being made in urine. Okay, okay. Now, now as uh, the other thing I was gonna, gonna ask you about, with ref, let's get back down to, again, I'm gonna take advantage of the opportunity that you here now because otherwise we're going to be talking about other things with, with Dr. Kingby. But there is, it, it, that makes some sense. Uh, you know, often uh, you've got both parties, mm -hmm. uh, both Democratic Party and Republican Party, and each uh, being asked to do an outreach, if you will, among women, minorities, et cetera, et cetera, and they tend to identify a particular uh, group or department or whatever to do that, and they're sort of outside the, the mix aspect of yeah. it. I, 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 I was interested in how you're dealing with this piece. Well, uh, I, I th a political party tries to do all sorts of things, but I have a, my specific personal uh, approach on this is that I don't like separating Americans. Uh, I don't like the idea that we're reaching out to the African American community or reaching out to the Hispanic community. Look, I'm, I'm talking to Americans, and the differences between us, whether I'm a scientist, I know about genetics, mm -hmm. the, gen the tiny genetic differences that affect, for example, skin color are silly. The, talking about it. So I think uh, uh, we should be talking to all Americans at the same time, and I don't think our political process should be separating them. Uh, there's no place for racism in America in any sense, so why should a political party divide the races and then approach them? I don't, I don't like that. So my own personal approach is that when we come to talk with the voters, whether it's in Multnomah County or another part of the state, we're talking to Americans. Sometimes we're talking to people in the middle class who are being oppressed badly by unsavory actions mm -hmm. <laughs> elsewhere mm -hmm. that we would like to stop. So there are economic differences. The poor are being crushed by some of the big government activities that are going on coming at us from Washington or Salem, and that's an issue. But I don't think we should be approaching people on the basis of, of uh, race or ethnic diversity or where they came from. We're all Americans. I don't, I don't like the division. Well, you know, because I'm personally involved in this piece yeah. to a certain degree, how, would you mind sharing your, 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 how you're outreaching as being the chair, how you approach this in, in terms of Well, the same thing. We, you, you are uh, head of a committee of the Oregon right. Republican Party, and uh, I asked you to do it. You came and uh, we talked about it. Uh, but you and I kind of agreed that we would speak to the people of Oregon, all of them. Uh, now, it is true that if you take the less affluent people in our state, you will find more African Americans among them. This is a historical accident. It's too bad, but it's true. S but uh, I think that their problems 
are shared by the Hispanic community, the white community, all the communities. So we talked. We used outreach for our community, mm -hmm. for our, instead of um, what was the engagement. Yeah, and we used engagement. Instead of using outreach, we chose engagement, and we did that to avoid uh, pretending that we were separating Oregonians or separating Americans, and that's what you and I have agreed to work on, to to bring a, a message to all the people, not just to individual groups. When you walk into the room, everyone knows your heritage. Oh, yes. When I walk in, they know my heritage. That's not the point. We're all Americans. We're not different. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that, and I want to make sure I shared this with the um, with the viewing audience, and even during the times of World Arts Foundation, Inc., because this is a very progressive kind of a concept that you've come up with, and one I've, uh, I've agreed with. In fact, even to the point that, uh, uh, you know, as I, as I laid out my so-called plan, mm -hmm. plan of action, I had identified Multnomah County and Portland as ground zero because that's mm -hmm. the perception that uh, most of you African Americans and, and Latinos, whatever, live within mm -hmm. this particular area. And so it's a ground zero, so to speak. And, and I'm in the process of trying to identify the issues, mm -hmm. not only just for, the, for that particular those groups, but because as you know, this is the largest, if mm -hmm. you will, the largest uh, city, if you will, in the state of Oregon, and, and there are many issues here involved, so that is identified. This, this, I sat there and watched your earlier guest. Right. The man sitting here was an educator, yeah. and he made some comments about education that were superb, and they resonated with me because I'm an educator, and I, wor I worked a long time in elementary education, and I brightened up the guy's right, you know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't paying attention to ethnicity. I was looking, he's an educator. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and that that's that's got to be the mindset. Very, and that was another part that I was very interested in. Some of the comments that you'd made when we, you and I had talked about my taking on this position, uh, is that um, uh, you you talked about your background in regards to raising your kids and educating mm -hmm. your kids, and 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 then after you talked more and more about because that was has been this, this issue about charter school and homeschool and public mm -hmm. schools and whatever, but at the, at the end of the day, it's about educating those kids, giving them the opportunity to be able to succeed. Right. But I would, you know, I, I really would like for you to share, because I know that you, you share with the public about the fact that we're only about eight minutes or so, if you can do that real mm -hmm. quick, like, about your homeschool piece, I mean, <laughs> and why, and how you got there. Well, my wife was a scientist, and we loved Oregon. We decided to move here, and with our colleagues, we started a little research laboratory in Josephine County. But unfortunately, in 1988, she died. And I was left with uh, six children between the ages of one and a half and twelve, and we and we were homeschoolers. Uh, we wanted uh, our children to have uh, an education that is not found in most public schools today. Uh, in the 1950s, we wouldn't have been homeschoolers. The education I got and she got in those schools was superb, but today there are problems. So we homeschooled, but how could I homeschool and take care of the family when my wife was gone? So we developed a means of self-teaching where the children taught themselves and they didn't require a teacher for the most part. It worked very well. All of them uh, got degrees in science and most of them have doctoral degrees today. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very blessed to have them. And we all still work together. Uh, we also are an extended family. Uh, I believe a family should work together through several generations. Mm -hmm. So we have an extended family, we all work together, and we're all scientists and engineers, and we're having a wonderful life. Uh, I owe that to the public schools, mm -hmm. which gave me a great start. Unfortunately, those schools have changed a lot, and we felt we should homeschool. If our schools can come back to the standard they should, and I believe that is emphasized most by local control, mm -hmm. that's my belief, then we won't necessarily have this today, but today about two or three million Americans are children are being homeschooled. It's worked well for us and it's, it's working well for those that are doing it, but there's too much, uh, there's too much uh, loss of students, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the African-American community where it isn't, the, the public schools fail them and we need to change that, we need to stop it. Uh, but my background is in homeschooling and uh, in fact it works so well, my kids uh, put their homeschool materials on on CD-ROMs, and now they have 60,000 students around the country. Wow, wow, so, wow, wow. So we've had a lot of fun. We want to spend more time. We've had a lot of fun, but partly it's a tragedy because we went that direction because of the diminished quality of American education mm -hmm. that in our public schools. Well, you know, when, when you mentioned that point about, uh, again, again, talking about engagement and talking about the kind of folks here mm -hmm. we want to focus in on, 
it's and they, they refer to that normally as grassroots. I noticed I, I saw a program just recently right. on Steve Dean's on Channel Eight that uh, he was interviewing Alan Alley, and mm -hmm. Alan Alley had referred to you as identifying with grassroots folks. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the corporate community aspect of it. That's right. Uh, uh, any comments? Would you like to? Any well, thoughts? Look, why, why, why would he identify you that way? And he would identify me that way because uh, my whole life's work in medicine, everything else, is concerned with individuals. I want to improve the quality, quantity, and length of human life, all human life. Mm -hmm. And as a scientist, I didn't really think about the politics of that. But when I enter politics, I see so many institutions that are not concerned about those things. I care about these people and I can help. And I, I know I can help uh, if I can improve the quality and qu best give the best life possible to the 300 million Americans. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind upsetting institutions that are harming them. I, guess. I appreciate that. Well, hey, we're going to spend more time on that, but i got about another minute and a half or whatever. I want to make sure that we get the, uh, i.e., the support, if you will. I take it you support, i.e., the, well, the, uh, the program over here at um, uh, here in, in, in off of Sandy Boulevard at Northeast 172nd and Sandy Boulevard, Monday, January the 20th, from 11 to 6.30 p.m., and, and hopefully you might even consider attending. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I can, I will. Appreciate no. that very much. Art, right, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I think you're going to be a great it's work great to, to Oregon. And hopefully we'll, we'll do our we, best. And when we get the Democrats sitting up here, you can just sit right for a minute. When we get the, <laughs> when we get the D on the other side, maybe you guys can talk a little bit more about that. And well, that would be interesting. We talk past each other quite a bit. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you that uh, that's a very important piece. But, but again, like I said, this foundation, what Dr. King was all about, you know, in terms of uh, being progressive now, uh, the word he was trying to do, getting folks together, uh, the, the dream speech that he had made aspect of it. And so here we are now, and we, we just happen to be in a political, political kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's very, very important. We're in need of leaders, mm -hmm. the grassroots folks. Uh, uh, our country is, is, I mean, they're, they're just doing anything they can to try to identify the fact that we need leadership in this country today. We have the leaders. The American people have all the leaders they need. We need an environment where they are empowered to protect well, us. Well, you can be part of that, and you've uh, made me a I'm part of that. I'm getting pretty old. I just do my best. Okay, and so we'll get Bob over here, and we'll get the D's over here, and we'll just have a good cross. Was it crossfire? Is that what they call it? Okay, fine. Folks, thank you very much for being a part of the show today, and please uh, get out on Dr. King's Day and participate. I realize there are a number of the activities uh, that are going to be doing this, but again, I'm, I'm, again, I'm supporting the... Uh, the, uh, the World Arts, the World, yeah, World Arts Foundation piece that they're going to be having at Anthem Conference Center, okay? So have a good one. Enjoy your day, and I'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>